Check out FlipSideGaming.com for all your gaming needs. Use the promo code HEROES to save 10% on all orders over $10. Between now and August 10th, if you use this promo code, you will automatically be entered into a drawing where four winners will each win one of the Commander 2018 pre-constructed decks. See the description below for more details. Hey there, this is John from Heroes and Legends, and welcome to part one of our four-part look at all of the Commander 2018 decks we're going to begin today with Exquisite Invention. We'll be looking at the full visual deck list, all the reprints, but we're going to spend some extra time on the new cards, giving you a complete review of each of those. Now, quickly before we get started, just a fast reminder, you heard at the beginning of the video, we're still running that promotion with Flipside Gaming, where hopefully you could win one of these four decks on August 10th when they come out. And all the details are in the description below if you want more information. Also, our Patreon page is down there, as well as some product links for Amazon. These are all ways to help support the channel. If you look at those, it's always appreciated, but not necessary. Your viewership is enough for me. So let's get into it. We're going to begin with the foil commander. So three of these cards in this particular product will be in foil. And any of these three could be your commander out of the box if you so chose, depending on what direction you want to go in. Now, later on, we're going to talk about upgrades. Once we do all these deck list videos in another week or so, we're going to start talking about what cards you might want to buy to upgrade. So keep that in mind as we go through some of these, because what's nice about these different commanders is they do have slightly different focuses. We'll begin with the featured commander, Sahili the Gifted. She'll be right on the front of the box when you buy this product. And she's a good choice as a commander because she's very well-rounded, especially if you enjoy using Planeswalkers for your commander, you're probably going to use this one. Now, the plus one creates servo tokens. You're going to see in a few moments how critical that is, because this is not just an artifact deck that's looking at economy. This is really an artifact creature swarm deck using tons of tokens, and that's actually pretty unique, and I like that design choice. So her plus one is going to come into play. Her second plus one definitely comes into play based on your board state, which is going to be very big at times, and it can help you power out some spells. That minus seven could help you take out an opponent, or just having a bigger board state just for a turn could impact other cards, and you'll see that as we go through today. Also note that this ability copies all your artifacts, not just creatures. So this is an awesome choice, very well-rounded commander for sure. Brutaclan, Telcor, Engineer, maybe my favorite of the three, honestly, because it's so unique. I mean, size-wise, it's not amazing for six mana, but just keep looking what this card does. Creature tokens you control have haste. Okay, that's kind of sweet, and you're going to see why in a few minutes when you see all these cards that create tokens. But also, it creates a token on its own, a 2-1 artifact token, but here's what I really like. Then you may choose a token you control. If you do, each other token you control becomes a copy of that token. That's kind of crazy. Not artifact token. Not even creature token, any tokens. It could be a clue token or whatever, but you can turn all your tokens into that type of token, and there's a lot of different things you could do with that. Sure, attacking is one thing. Maybe you need some flyers, make everything thopters and wonderful, just attack in. Or you could have some constructs. There's actually a possibility of getting a 612 trample token. Maybe you turn all your tokens into that. That could be really good for you. There's also ways to get some really unique individualized tokens, which we're going to see later on as we go through some of the reprints. And notice that the effect does not end at the end of the turn. The tokens stay in that form until it triggers again. So with all of those ways to exploit this card, I kind of want to try this one out. Thanos, or is his apprentice? I'm glad Thanos got a card. That's kind of sweet. First off, sometimes I like cheaper commanders. You get to play them early, you get to play them often. And now we have that whole storm cycle. This particular deck comes with Echo Storm, which we're going to look at in a few moments. So there are advantages to playing some of these cheaper commanders sometimes. Also, too, it's not a huge sizable threat or anything like that, but being able to activate this to copy target activated or triggered ability you control from an artifact source is pretty versatile. I mean, yes, sometimes that is playing into what this deck's primary goal is by using a triggered ability to create maybe another Thopter or something like that. But also, there's a lot of other random abilities that you could copy with this that could be quite strong. Now, aside from all that, remember, it can't use this ability on mana ability, so you can't use it to ramp out, but that's okay. There's still a lot you can do with this. This is probably my third choice out of the three as commander just out of the box, but I could see myself trying to build around this a little bit in the future. All right, let's look at some new creatures. Loyal Drake. Uh, it's a win Drake, but it has some upside. If you have your commander in play, you get to draw an extra card, so that's never a bad thing. It is a little bit better probably just out of the box here because there are ways to draw cards in this deck you're going to see as we go through, but there's not as many as you would expect from an Izzet deck. So any little bit might help you. Now you could upgrade this deck probably and switch this out and you wouldn't really miss it, but it's just fine. Fidelkin Humiliator. 
Okay, I like when they build these decks, and they also do this in sometimes like the Conspiracy and Battle Bond sets. They try to find ways that if you're just playing the cards out of the box, that you're going to be able to close out games. So these games aren't going to go on for like eight hours. And this is one of those cards. Basically, what's nice about this is you have a bunch of 1-1s or something like that, and your opponent's staring at you with a whole bunch of like 10-10 dragons. This still kind of puts you on even par and allows you to get across some heavy damage. Maybe even take that opponent out under the right circumstances. This card enables that type of thing. So it just makes all your other little tokens better. This would work great with a card like Pyrohemia too. Loyal Apprentice. Okay, this is just another way to get Thopter tokens. You're going to see a lot of cards like this in this particular deck. And yeah, 2 one haste for 2, whatever. Those probably could have been any stats. It's all about trying to get tokens. And yes, you do have to have your commander in play to get them, but this is just another way to garner more board state. Treasure Nabber. Okay, this one's pretty sweet. First off, the art is incredible. That goblin just stole the soul ring, which is phenomenal. But beyond that, I just like how cerebral this card is. Like you play this thing, it's just a little 3-2 three, for 3. But then your opponents all have decisions to make. Are they going to use their mana rocks and take the risk of giving you a little bit of a mana push? Or are they just going to slow down their game? Or could they play the political card and say, hey, you know what? I'll tap this and let you have it. And then maybe we can help each other out. The other option with this, and this isn't right out of the box. You'd have to upgrade. But if you threw like an Atog style creature into your deck, then you could simply play this first, maybe get somebody's mana rock. And then when it comes back to your turn before you have to give it back at the end of your turn, play that card and then sacrifice their stuff to it. That could be kind of funny. So yeah, there's a lot of different routes you could go with this card. As a matter of fact, at least right now, now remember, of course, the product hasn't come out yet, but right now the pre-release price for this card is around $10. It will go down once these decks hit the stores and everything, but at least for right now, a lot of people are excited about this card. It just seems like it's a lot of fun. Varchild, Betrayer of Jeldor. Who would have thunk it? A knight in an Izzet deck. This card is really cool. I mean, it's a little fragile being a 3-3. I like that Varchild has a card, though. I do want to say that before I go on. But the card itself, yes, if you can get across the damage, it's awesome. Because once you start doing that and the damage is hitting, then you're going to start creating these survivor tokens. And you're kind of creating chaos on the battlefield. You're giving out these survivor tokens. They can't attack you, which is awesome. They can't block, so maybe someone decides to attack someone else with them. And then someone retaliates. All of a sudden, you're just instigating all of this chaos, and I love that. The problem being, you do have to get across with this 3-3. It doesn't have trample, doesn't have evasion. I mean, there's ways to finesse that, of course, but out of the hand, it just doesn't always do a whole lot, and that's kind of sad. Now, when it does die, you get control of those survivors, which is kind of cool, too, because it's just going to add to your swarm. Ancient Stone Idol, as we move into Artifact Creatures. Nice callback, too, to Stone Idol Trap couple of things about this card. First off, I just like the general power behind it quite a bit because it has flash. It's a 12-12 with trample. It costs 10, but it costs one less for each attacking creature. So, of course, this deck has a lot of little creatures. It won't be too hard to play this really cheap, maybe even for free. But remember, it's attacking creatures. It doesn't have to be your attacking creatures. So if there's an opponent playing like a Selesnia token deck and they attack with a whole bunch of tokens, all of a sudden you can just flash this into play, right? That's kind of awesome. Now, when it dies, you also get a 612 colorless construct artifact token with trample. And remember, we just saw Brutaclad, which could turn all your tokens into that particular token. That would not be a bad choice. Geode Golem. This is a fun card. Like, I don't know if it's always going to work out for you in a game of Commander. If you play it early enough, it will. And this particular deck, I mean, they don't really have super expensive commanders. The most expensive one is Brutaclad for six. And of course, Sahili's four and Tanos is two. But if I was playing with some really big, expensive commander, like, yeah, this could be a lot of fun to try to cheat it out, like, on turn six or something. And that could be a huge play. Like, I don't know, the Ur-Dragon comes to mind. There's so many just really hard to cast commanders out there that are powerful. So, yeah, if I'm going down that route, yeah, this seems like it's pretty good. In this deck, it feels a little wasted. Also, keep in mind, too, you still have to pay commander tax because you still have to pay any additional costs. All right, let's move on to some new sorceries. And the first one is Echo Storm. Now, if you've been watching the previews, I've been gushing over this cycle all week, so you know how I feel about it. These cards are awesome. I love the fact that if you play this maybe early before you play your commander for the first time, it's not super economical, but these are all still good abilities, a little overcosted. But you play your commander once, you play it twice, play it three times, the card gets better and better and better as the game goes on. 
you eventually get to the point at the end of the game where you could maybe even take somebody out with one of these abilities and have a really powerful spell on your hands. And especially if someone was hating out your commander throughout the game, these could be great for you. So this particular one, create a token that's a copy of target artifact. Not your artifact. Any artifact doesn't have to be an artifact creature. It can truly be anything. And when you make copies, you can target all different things if you want to. You can make a clue token here. You can make a construct 612 trample there. You can do whatever you want. I love the versatility. And yeah, many times you might just be copying a bunch of thopters or something to try to win the game. But other times you'll find better things to do with it. Card's awesome. Sahili's Directive. I love this cool take on Genesis Wave, like a red artifact version of it. It has improvised, which is going to be great in this deck too, but it allows you to go through your deck and just pour out a bunch of artifacts, and it's really awesome. Beyond that too, what you don't put into the battlefield goes to the graveyard, which I do like that better than bottom of the deck, even though this particular deck doesn't exploit that. There are ways, of course, to maybe use this card in a different deck where you could have some graveyard shenanigans as well. So Awesome card, just generally really happy to see this. All right, we got one new enchantment. It's Enchanter's Bane. So this came from the need in Commander anyway for Red to be able to have some kind of answer for an enchantment here or there. This is an okay one, and yeah, I got to look at it this way. Is this my first choice to deal with an enchantment? No, but if I only have this open to me, then it's fine, right? So here's the thing. It's cheap, I'll give it that. But your opponent still is making the decision. They're going to decide whether they want to take the damage and keep the enchantment. Or if they don't care about the enchantment, then they'll dump it. Or if they can't deal with taking the damage, then, of course, they'll dump the enchantment. So it's ultimately up to them. And when it's up to your opponent, you're going to have to expect that you're going to get the least impactful result from the spell. But again, you're only paying two for it. The other funny thing about this is if this is the only enchantment in play, then it turns back around on you. It has to target itself, and then you have to make that same decision. So I like the balance here. I mean, yes, red should not be able to take care of enchantments very easily. So this plays into that concept very well. Yeah, it is still something you can do. New artifacts. Here's Coveted Jewel. This is awesome because so many people play Gilded Lotus for five nowadays. For one more mana, you get to Ancestral Recall as well. Now, the downside is if you get attacked with a creature and don't block it, then this goes to the player that attacked you. So you start passing this around the table a little bit, which kind of adds to the chaos, I guess. But you could also maybe use it as a political game as well. Someone says, let me attack you with my 1-1. One, one. I really need that jewel. We can team up. And they get to draw cards, and they get extra mana for at least a time. And even so, if you can defend yourself, and this deck shouldn't have too much of a problem with that between Thopters and Servos and such, then you have a better chance of just hanging on to this longer and just using the mana. So this is pretty sweet. There's also a lot of good reasons to have mana available to you that's outside your color identity. You're going to see that as we go through today because there are some ways to copy other people's things. Endless Atlas. This is a good tome effect, but you do have to have enough basic lands of a given type for you to activate it. So it's not for every deck. It's fine in this deck out of the box, though. You have a lot of islands and a lot of mountains. You'll see that at the end. And again, there's not a ton of ways to draw additional cards in this deck when you compare it to maybe other Izzet builds. So this becomes pretty useful. Retrofitter Foundry. Wow, this card's cool. I mentioned when it was previewed, I kind of want to play this with Mana Echoes because that would be super sweet. So that will definitely come up. But as for today, out of the box, this is still pretty good. It's almost like a trading post to just help you get the tokens you need eventually anyway. I like that it can untap itself so you can use it more than one time per turn perhaps. But also on the fly, being able to create a servo token's nice. Sacrifice the Servo to get a Thopter. Sacrifice the Thopter to get a 4-4 Construct. So it does give you a variety of different tokens, which definitely could matter with Brutaclad, so keep that in mind. But it also just helps you eventually build up your army a little bit. Really cool card, actually. Okay, you get one new land here. It's Forge of Heroes. And this is, again, fine in this deck because the colorless mana isn't going to put you off or anything like that. You have a lot of ways to get mana of the colors you need. Now, the ability is interesting, and again, this is one of those cards we're going to be talking more about when we get to upgrades, because I would really like to try this out with Marchesa, maybe. But, at least for now, yeah, I can make my Sahili come in with one more loyalty counter, or I can make my other two come in with a plus one, plus one counter. So, yeah, out of the box, this is still very useful. Also, it doesn't have to be your commander. Like, this could be a political game, too, where you give a little boost to someone else's commander and maybe form an alliance. So, yeah, I like cards that give you that versatility. 
Okay, let's move on to the reprints. I'm going to go faster now since you're probably pretty familiar with these cards for the most part. And a lot of these get reprinted frequently. Ethereum Sculptor, kind of a no-brainer. You almost expected it here. Inkwell Leviathan, very, very hard to deal with card with Shroud in that Island Walk and sometimes and some games for players. Very good artifact creature here. Sharding Sphinx, sizable flyer, 4-4, four, four, but that ability is what this is all about. And it's an artifact on its own too, and that could matter. But look at that, whenever an artifact creature you control, which includes this, deals combat damage to a player, you get to create a Flying Thopter, 1-1. One, one. That's kind of awesome. Really helps you build out your board state quickly. Whirler Rogue. Here's one that was not put in here by accident. Another card that's going to help end games. Tap two untapped artifacts you control. Target creature can't be blocked this turn. That's a huge deal in this deck. And it also makes you some colorless thopter tokens when it enters the battlefield. Hellkite Igniter. Now, it doesn't have any kind of like trample or anything like that, but it does have flying. If you can surprise somebody with this, it could sometimes, sometimes knock them out of a game just because it could be really big in this deck. Now, the toughness doesn't go up, and that is a problem, but every once in a while, you could get by with one with this card. Thopter Engineer, another card that's going to grant haste, this time to artifact creatures, so that's pretty sweet. And again, another way to create a Thopter token. Maverick Thopterist, this is another way to make a couple Thopter tokens, and this has Improvise. Also, it's important to know, with the copy effects that are in this deck, some of these Enter the Battlefield effects do become a little bit better. Bosch Iron Golem, on its own, good creature. 8 casting cost, 6, 7 trample, is an artifact creature, perfect for the deck. But it's really all about this ability here. Now, it doesn't really help you with your tokens because it does do damage based on converted mana cost, but it can fling some big stuff around at any target, including itself. Chief of the Foundry, another kind of no-brainer here, huge in this deck. Darksteel Juggernaut, this is an okay card. I always kind of wished it had Trample or something, but it does have Indestructible, which makes it a little more difficult to deal with, and I do like that, and it can be quite sizable, potentially, in this deck. Duplicant, kind of makes sense here again. It's an artifact creature that is also removal, so it does feel like it definitely fills a role here. There's also not as many removal spells as maybe I would like, just generally in this deck too, so I'm glad to see this. Mere Battle Sphere. All right, the Battle Ball is back, and this is great in Commander. It's great in Cubes. This makes some tokens for you, but also can put a lot of damage across if it needs to. Pilgrim's Eye. Yeah, at least it's an artifact creature. It lets you look for a land, which is always nice to make sure you hit your land drops. But again, in a two-color deck, it doesn't feel as necessary as maybe other builds. Psychosis Crawler. Like I was saying, there's not a ton of ways to draw cards. There's enough for this to matter, I suppose. Tanos could actually help add to the card draw, considering there are some artifacts with card draw activated abilities we'll be looking at. Sometimes it's not a good idea to put a card out that impacts all opponents at the same time if you can't defend yourself, but this deck usually, I think, will be able to defend itself pretty well. Scuttling Doom Engine. This is a little better one-on-one -on -one than in Commander. It's okay, though. Again, it's a fine artifact creature, 6-6 six, six creature, but more importantly, it can't be blocked by creatures of power 2 or less, and when it dies, it gets the fling 6 damage in an opponent or Planeswalker. So, again, just fine. Just nothing crazy in a multiplayer game. Soul of New Phyrexia. This is really good because it's going to protect you against board sweeps. There's actually a card coming up in a little bit we're going to look at that is also a board sweep that you might be using. So this protects your stuff, and even in combat situations, being able to block with some 1-1s and then still keep them around can be quite good. Also, 6-6 six, six, Trample, not bad. Steel Hellkite. This is one way to deal with some non-land permanents that you might not have other ways to deal with within this particular deck, and it's also a good artifact creature with flying. Thopter Assembly. Okay, this card makes me wish Time Sieve was in here first and foremost. We'll have to talk about that in another video. But on its own, it's just fine. I mean, there's not going to be probably tons of times where you get this and you don't have a Thopter in play, but when you do, it's going to be great. Or if something just happened, maybe a board sweep or something, this helps you recover very quickly. And on its own, still a 5-5 five, five flyer for 6, and it's an artifact. Pretty good in this deck. Sorceries. Ether Gale. This is a fine generic bounce spell. Return 6 target non-land permanents to their owner's hand. It is sorcery speed, unfortunately, but... It's any targets. It can be some of your stuff if you need it to be. It can be some of your opponent's stuff. Whatever you need to take care of, at least temporarily, you can tempo it out. 
Reverse Engineer. Here's a sorcery spell that will let you draw some cards, three of them to be precise, and most of the time this is only going to cost you two blue, considering the improvise. Sahili's Artistry. Perfect in this deck. It's going to create a token that's a copy of target artifact and create a token that's a copy of target creature. Doesn't have to be your stuff. It can be anything. That creature is also going to be an artifact, even if it wasn't before, and that could be relevant. Now think about this with Bruticlad's ability. You could copy some crazy strong creature and then turn all your tokens into a copy of that creature. Yeah, that doesn't feel bad at all, right? Also, if you happen to copy something with an activation cost that's a different color outside your color identity, there are some cards that will cover you there. We saw one earlier, but there's more coming. Tidings, another card draw spell here. Blasphemous Act. This is what I was alluding to earlier. This will work well with Soul of New Phyrexia, but in a pinch, if you need to deal with a lot of things on the board, this will do it. Maybe not everything, but most things. All right, let's look at Instance. You get into the Royal. Classic card. I mean, always solid. Thirst for Knowledge. Another way to draw cards, and this will be effective with artifacts. Chaos Warp. I actually like this card. I'm not always a huge fan of the high variance cards, but because this one is an instant, I like it because it can kind of put a stop to things coming at me, like an attacking creature or some other card that has an activated ability or something that I'm worried about. I can just play this at instant speed and kind of bury that card. And yeah, the person is going to get something else. But if I'm really worried about that particular card, I'm fine with that for three at instant speed. And I can use this on my stuff as well, which is perfect in this deck, as a matter of fact. Magma Quake. This will work really well again with Soul of New Phyrexia. And it's Earthquake, but it also impacts Planeswalkers. There's nothing wrong with that. Enchantments. Just one here, and it's Thopter Spy Network. Perfect card, though. It's going to create more Thopter tokens with flying for you. And it's also going to allow you to draw some cards here or there. Awesome in this deck. Artifacts. Blink Moth Urn. Well, this will give you a lot of mana in this deck. There's no doubt about that. It's also going to give your opponent some mana, which isn't always a bad thing. Sometimes being able to help opponents means people want you to stick around a little bit longer. If you want to upgrade your deck and give yourself more ways to tap your own artifacts, that could be another way to kind of prevent people from utilizing this thing's power. But unless they're running another artifact deck or something, you're probably going to get much more advantage out of this than they are. Commander's Sphere. These are always good to have. I love these cards. They just kind of help you out by getting the mana the color you need. And then when you don't need this anymore, you can switch it out for a card draw. Kind of the same thing here with Dreamstone Hedron. I mean, yeah, it taps for three colorless mana, but later on you can just sack it for three cards. Hedron Archive, same story here. Is it Signet? Always good to have a Signet. I always enjoy playing with these. Magnifying Glass. Here's a way to make clue tokens, which does go towards artifact count. And also, again, if you want to turn all your stuff into clue tokens for some reason and draw a bunch of cards, I guess you could. So, yeah, I'm glad this exists. You at least wanted to have one way to make a clue token here, I think. Mimic Vat. All right, here's another way to make tokens that could be just any creature. Basically, you imprint something that dies on here, and then for three and tap, you get to create a token that's a copy of it, and it could be anything. Now, you do exile it at the beginning of the next end step, but that's okay, because again, you could use Bruticlad's ability on this. It could be super sweet. Mindstone. Okay, another one of these type of cards, but another good one. Mirror Works. This is good in the deck. It doesn't work on tokens, though, so keep that in mind, but there's still a lot of other good targets for it. Prismatic Lens, good way to get a color of mana that's outside your identity, especially, again, if you copy something that has an activated cost or something. Prototype Portal, another way to create a unique token. It's going to be great with Bruticlad, too. Scrambling Claws, maybe not the best way to deal with graveyard interactions, but a way to deal with some graveyard interactions. And it's a cheap artifact. It draws you cards, so it kind of makes sense in this deck. Soul Ring, of course. You can't play Commander without a Soul Ring, right? I think that's one of the rules now. Swift Foot Boots. Now, it doesn't have Lightning Greaves, but this is still pretty good, especially in this deck. Unstable Obelisk. Well, this does let you get rid of a target permanent, and there's not a lot of ways to do that in this deck, so for that reason alone, it's worth running. Unwinding Clock. This is pretty cool because this is not a cheap reprint. These will run you like $7, $8, so this is, out of all the reprints, the most valuable card you're going to find in this particular deck, and I'm glad they included it because it really could use a reprint. Vessel of Endless Rest, well, another way to sort of interact with graveyards, but more importantly, getting a mana of any color could come in handy at times. Worn Power Stone, not Sol Ring, but another classic card. 
And let's look at the lands. You get a Buried Ruin. Fantastic in this deck. Command Tower, again, kind of a staple. Unless you have a monocolor deck, probably no reason not to run one of these. Darksteel Citadel. This is an artifact land, so it will go towards your artifact count. Foundry of Consoles. Yeah, it's fine. I mean, it gives you mana, and eventually you can turn it into a couple Thopters. Nothing crazy here, but it's okay. Here's another artifact land with Great Furnace. Highland Lake. Okay, come into play, tap dual lands. Yeah, don't expect shock lands or fetch lands in these products. This is serviceable out of the box, but obviously this is something you could upgrade. Is it Boiler Works? Even if I do upgrade the mana base, I still like bounce lands. Here's another one of these comes into play. Tap lands with Is it Guild Gate? Sea to Sanad, another artifact land. Swiftwater Cliffs, another comes into play. Tap land. And here's your basics. You get 15 islands and 12 mountains. All right, my final thoughts on the product is this. Basically, when it comes to Commander, I think everybody should play the deck that looks fun to them. If you like the look of this deck, if you enjoy artifacts, if you enjoy swarm token decks, artifact tokens, then yes, this will be the deck for you. Play it, you're going to have a good time with it. If that doesn't sound fun, then stay away from this one. When it comes to upgrade options, I know I've been teasing that I'm going to do an upgrade video later on next week. And yeah, there's a lot of actually cool upgrades you can do with this deck or focus in on a certain direction and even change out a lot of cards to maybe go even stronger with, say, tokens or take out some of the token strategy and look at perhaps some of the triggered ability strategies like with Thanos. And you could do something almost completely different if you want to. So yeah, this deck does leave room for a lot of flexibility, and I do like that as well. It's a good shell, though, and I think if you played this out of the box, I don't think you'd be disappointed. It feels like it could hold its own against the other three decks, and I don't feel like it's lacking in power or anything like that. It's got some good win conditions and some good ways to set up wins. Now, aside from all that, my biggest criticism of the product this year is the value. It's gone up $5. These used to cost $34.99. This year, they're going to cost you $39.99. I was expecting to see better value reprints with the price increase. Unfortunately, that's not what happened. As a matter of fact, we have less value than maybe ever before looking at it. So what I mean by that is gameplay is fine. Like you could argue maybe these decks are a little less powerful than some of the decks in the past. But if you play them against each other out of the box or if you upgrade them, which is what most people do, I'm fine with that. I don't really have an issue with the base power level of the deck. But I do have an issue if you don't get at least a few reprints that are maybe worth around the $10, $15 mark more consistently. There's a couple in the Bant deck, which we're going to look at later in the week. But this deck, for example, the best reprint was $7 or $8, and that was pretty much it. Everything else was about $3 or less, which really does not feel very satisfying, especially when you're paying $5 more. So I do think Wizards needs to focus in on that piece. Right now, I just don't feel like I'm getting my money's worth. And I'm not even talking about trying to flip this product. That's never a good idea when it comes to these things. Even the best decks in the past weren't something you're going to go run out and then sell off for parts or anything like that. And that's not what this product should be. But I feel like we should be getting a little more value than we are getting. And I do think that is a problem this year. And I get it. If you add up all the cards, they're worth a little over $100. But you got to remember, bulk cards are not going to be worth what they seem to be worth on paper unless you own a game store or something. So that's the only downside. I do want to try these decks out and play with them, but I see myself more and more just thinking about upgrades like right away, more so than I have in other years. But again, that's probably because the reprint value is a little bit less, thus the power level is a little bit less too. So anyway, those are my overall thoughts. There's definitely room for this product to improve, which is kind of sad because this was always one of my favorite products of the year. All right, with that being said, that's part one of this four-part series. We're going to be back tomorrow with our Market Watch video. So we're going to take a look and see how some of these reveals this week are impacting the market. Then we'll go forward after that with the rest of this series starting on Sunday. So until then, hey, thanks for watching. Please remember to like and subscribe and have a great day. Hey, thanks for watching. This video is made possible by the generous support of viewers like you on Patreon. Check out the description below for links to our Patreon page as well as our Amazon affiliate store, where a small percentage of all sales will also help support the channel. Finally, if you haven't had a chance yet to subscribe, hit that subscribe button so you don't miss any new videos on Heroes and Legends. Talk to you again soon, and have a great day.